Welcome to PHP Application Security. My name is Anna Felina. I rescue projects, put them back on track. I develop, I train, I speak at conferences. And I'm a consultant at a company called Zenica. So maybe you haven't heard of it. Uh, it's more popular in France, has about 300 employees. Um, so I go on missions for this company and I um, optimize performance, things like that. So this course is going to be packed with information. So there's going to be quite a lot of theory. We're going to have exercises throughout. So I'll give you examples for the different categories of vulnerabilities. And then we're going to try and patch for that vulnerability. OK, so not all examples have actual code solutions, but I'll show you the different countermeasures you can use. So we'll start with the application hardening basics. So first of all, what that is, uh, the whole principle behind it, because that's going to guide you in the future. Then we're going to cover about 12 categories of uh, vulnerabilities. After that, we're going to talk about uh, how to identify and cl classify the vulnerabilities. And then we'll do threat modeling to uh, you know, rank those risks. And that's uh, uh, Threat modeling is something that you will use um, once you start identifying all the threats that you have and then decide basically which ones should be addressed and which ones shouldn't. Right. Uh, okay. So let's talk about application hardening. So application hardening, hardening is all about the attack surface. Uh, an attack surface is the sum of all paths into and out of the application. So if there's a port open, that's a path into your application. You have a form that people submit, any sort of input. Uh, FTP server where people deposit files, all of these are ways that people can get into your server. And paths out is anything that goes out that people can intercept or, or um, they can use that also as a way to attack you. So attacking doesn't necessarily mean like DDoSing. It, there's all sorts of attacks. Um, so then you have code that protects these paths. Okay, And the, the code it can be code, it can be other devices, it can be a, a firewall, it could be a, a physical security system. Then you have uh, the valuable data that uh, is used in the application. So you have, to, you have to know what has value, what doesn't. So for example, email addresses of your, of your users are potentially valuable. Credit card numbers may be a lot more so. Uh, other data is pretty much pointless because it's like links between different users, things like that. Nobody really cares about that. Or you know, maybe you have the data, the content that is publicly visible anyway, so it doesn't really have much value if it's, if it's stolen. And then you have the code that protects the data. And the whole point is to reduce the surface of attack. So the idea is not to eliminate those threats altogether, although you can. It's not practical. You cannot eliminate all possible threats out there because new one, people are coming up with new ones all the time. So you have to, you have to think about the, the surface and you have to reduce it. How can you do that? You can reduce the amount of code running. That's actually pretty logical. Um, if you have a lot of code, you cannot keep track of it. You don't know what it does, uh, especially in legacy applications. Um, most people don't know what the code does. Um, and that code can be potentially vulnerable. So it's a big surface. So you have to review and simplify your code. Always reduce the code that you have so that you can then more effectively audit that for security vulnerabilities. You have to refactor your legacy code continuously. Uh, basically, my rule of thumb is if you touch it, you have to make it better. So you have to clean it up a bit. You don't have to go on a big, uh, let's do like five sprints of legacy refactoring. That's, that has very little value in itself. So what you do as you work on your tickets, um, you touch certain areas of the code when you do that, you're going to try to improve that a little bit and leave it cleaner as when you arrived. Then you have to delete dead code. That is actually very important. People underestimate how much dead code they have running. I've had also, it's not just dead code, sometimes it's a lot of duplication. 
So let's say I, I took over a project a few years ago and I had to optimize it for performance. And as I did that, I found some bugs, so we had to address the bugs. There was a, one bug that was repeated 80 times, that's eight zero. It was repeated because a big uh, template was copied 80 times. Okay, so each controller, which was more or less the same, pointed to a different template. So the, instead of using variables and, and adapt that template for the different cases, they just duplicated everywhere. And that means it's a lot more code, and uh, 79 of those templates are basically dead code. So you have to remove that. Uh, forms have to be simpler. There have to be fewer of them because forms are a very good entry into the application. So you have to be very careful because now you're accepting user data and that is potentially dangerous. Not only forms, but um, it's one of the most common ways to, uh, to get into a system. Especially if there's, a, well actually, there's a, in, a, in addition to having those forms, uh, the data, if it's not well protected, can be intercepted. So the forms, if you don't have HTTPS, people can see what you submit. Uh, they can intercept that data and that's, that's also bad for you. So they can start um, leaching that data off of you as it goes through. It's a bit like having a keylogger. Yeah, so if you have a blo bloat in your code, you have a big attack surface, you are more vulnerable than not. So the thing about dead code, just because it's not running doesn't mean that you're not wasting resources on that. So some people think, well, it's dead code anyway. I mean, we can clean it up, but what doesn't matter, it doesn't run anyway. Well, you still have to review it because you stumble upon it. You don't always realize that it's dead code. I mean, some, um, some IDs now can flag that, but they're not always 100% uh, accurate. But still, if you have dead code, you are wasting precious resources reviewing it. Sometimes the dead code represents more in terms of lines of code than the actual code that you are running. And that is a huge waste of resources. All right, then you have to reduce the entry points to untrusted users. So like anonymous users on the internet, for example. Uh, debug mode in production is a very good way to expose way too much information. And people say, well, it's, it's okay. I mean, what can you do with stack traces? Well, with stack traces, I can know which versions of which plugins you run. I can find known vulnerab vulnerabilities for those versions. And then I can attack you through those. And if I know uh, the paths of your, of your files, then if I want to perform an attack where I override the file, well, I already know your folder structure. I know the absolute path to some config file that I can read maybe for those who still keep config files you know, um, on their file system. API endpoints, also untrusted, so anybody can access them, so you have to protect them with some sort of keys, you have to think about your access control layer. Uh, another example is don't allow DB access or admin login forms from outside the network. So I've seen people opening up their MySQL to, uh, to any connection from any network instead of keeping it inside of their network. So between the HTTP server and the um, database server. But no, some people open it up for the world and that just exposes that to uh, all sorts of attacks. Uh, also PHP MyAdmin running in production, that's not a very good idea. You should instead log into the uh, one of the servers on the network and from there connect to MySQL and just do your work through that. Files can be accessible via the web server and I've seen that very often and even up until quite recently WordPress um, had its index.php file um, at the same level as the configuration file. So you put your credentials and your index and that means that if you don't put the HT access correctly, then people can, from the outside world, can just type the location of the configuration file and view it in plain text. So that's really annoying. And I've, I see a lot of those applications that you download and just unpack onto your web server. 
um, they do that. They just they don't separate the application code from the the web root. So here's an example. Like for those who are not familiar with that, um, here's my project. If the V host points to that location, that's dangerous because you have the config folder. From there, you can have access to everything, config or source. So if you want to perform an attack, you can just go directly through the browser um, because maybe the person hasn't secured it correctly. And then, uh, so the good approach is to have a public folder where you only put the entry, and that is going to um, also load the other stuff from your uh, from your web server. Um, so that's that's the pretty basic advice. Um, you can have other configurations in here to protect that. Like as I said, if you could have a um, an HC access file, or if you're using nginx, you can you can configure it so that people cannot just access any type of file through the browser. That's fine, but the thing is, you never know what's going to happen in the future. You never know who's going to be maintaining this application. So what you need to do is have multiple layers of protection. So if one fails because somebody made a, an honest mistake or somebody overlooked something, then you can fall back to the second one. So having the proper structure already protects you from that. So even if all the other layers fail, people will still not be able to get into your configuration. This is something that people don't like as advice because they're like, well, no, but people are actually using those features. But yes, if you have relatively few users uh, using certain services, uh, you might not want to keep them because it's, all, it's very costly to, to maintain them and to upkeep the security. And some, sometimes people, they just want to have, have it all and have all the performance and all the security, but the reality of, of, the, uh, of the enterprise is that you don't have the resources to maintain everything, and sometimes you might want to make the decision to pull the plug on certain features that are so underused um, that basically they, they create more running code for very little value in return. So this is something you can, you can consider. Low value code will also be reviewed less, less frequently because you're not going to get too many client complaints or, or new requests, you know, so you're not going to enhance that code. So it's just going to lay there in a corner used by a couple of users. Nobody's going to review that code. Nobody's going to uh, upgrade that. And that can, be, that can be dangerous for you. Because if you don't review it, uh, new attacks come out, plugins get, get um, new vulnerabilities in them, you don't update that because you don't maintain that part of the application anymore. You can also turn off unnecessary functionality by closing ports that you don't use, that's pretty obvious, uh, but a lot of people, they, I've seen them, for example, with Postgres, there's like the primary port, the, the default one, and there's the fallback port, and people keep both open for no apparent reason. Um, uninstall unused software, like apt-get, and you install all the stuff you need, and then you never uninstall it, but it's still there, it's running, and it's potentially vulnerable. And especially, as I said, if you don't use it, then you will never look into it again. And that's where the danger is. If you, if you touch something very often, you're, you're going to eventually, you know, maybe throw it away. It's like a bit like clothes, you know. You, you look at this, this T-shirt at the end of the, uh, at the end of the, the um, hanger. You, you, never, you never see it, so you don't realize you even have it, so you will never throw it away. But the ones that you use quite often, you're going to say, well, I don't like this thing anymore, so I'm just going to donate that. Well, with code, it's very similar. If it's somewhere there in the corner that you never see it, like you know this box that you put somewhere, and one day you take it out, like why do I still keep all this trash? You know, but you realize like ten years later that you had this box lying around. Same with code. Except that by lying around, it is a vulnerability, or it eventually becomes a vulnerability as people find new ways to exploit that. So uninstall that unused software, remove code features that you don't use. 
So make sure that only the stuff that you actively maintain is kept. If you don't actively maintain that, that's a, that's a, that's a potential threat. You can also reduce unnecessary transit. So people send you know, credentials back and forth. I've seen APIs that ask for credentials on every request. That's not a good idea because it gives a lot more opportunities for people to intercept that and get the credentials. So basically, you intercept any API request, and you have credentials in there, potentially, that you can, you can decode, that you can exploit. And also, uh, don't send data that is not needed. And also, don't store data that you don't need. Some people don't realize that, but maybe you're storing things just for the sake of storing that. But by storing it, especially with the new laws, just by storing it, you are exposing yourself to the risk of getting it stolen. But if you don't need it, you're, you're, store, you're basically just exposing people to more risk. So yeah, this advice. They can steal it if you don't store it. Sounds silly, but it's actually a good practice. So only collect the data that you really need. And if you do need certain data, you can keep it for a shorter period of time and then discard it when it's no, no longer needed. For example, if you say, well, I collect all this data because then I aggregate it. OK, but once you're done aggregating, you can throw away the original data because you don't need it anymore. And eventually, um, as I said, reduce, re reduce that. Um, you can also make stored data unusable. So. Unusable means that if people steal that data, they still cannot do anything with that. Maybe because it's not directly linked to any account, maybe because it's hashed or, or encrypted. So just by getting the data itself, they might not do much with it. So you have to make it useless to them. So there are, there are many ways. So when I talk about storing less data, like, so what kind of data can you store, should you store or should you not store? That really depends on your business. But at the same time, like let's say you need to collect social security numbers or something like that. You want to collect that because you, you validate that against something and then maybe later you don't need it anymore. Let's say you, you use that as a, a key to fetch some information about the user. And then you can just discard it because you've already used it. Uh, credit card numbers, you don't actually need to store them yourself unless you are uh, a business that, that needs to do that. You can store credit cards in vaults. And there's going to be a section about that. Uh, IP addresses, current locations, there are so many things that we store that we probably don't need. So don't, don't retain data after it's it's no longer useful to you. So unless, once again, unless you're actively using that data, just discard it. You, you don't need it because you're just creating a big stash. You're, you're hoarding all this information, just waiting for somebody and steal your treasure, basically. You're like a dragon, you know, with all the gold. Yeah, and you can make it unusable through hashing. So we talk, we mentioned, I mentioned layers earlier. So. People think, OK, so I have this awesome wall and nobody's getting through it. That's not how it works. So this is a, a picture of uh, Minas Tirith. So if you remember from the Lord of the Rings, they have multiple layers. So when one, one area falls, they fall back to the next wall and they can defend it. They can defend this area. So that's how security works. You have one layer, a second layer, a third layer. There's never too many layers unless it really chugs your performance. But there's really not, there's an infinity of layers you can put. So don't think, well, I don't care about storing passwords and plain text in my database because nobody's getting into my database. And of course, we know how that turned out in the last few years for companies. Data breach after data breach, you know, Dropbox leaks all its passwords, Yahoo, like a billion accounts leaked. It's, it's crazy. And that's because they say our security is bulletproof. No, you have to you have to have your security, and you, um, you have to protect your database from intrusion. But you also have to protect your your data inside. So make sure that you hash encrypt it. Do something with it that will make it unusable. 
or at least not immediately ready for consumption. So now we're going to talk about coding vulnerabilities. We're going to have 12 categories, and for each category I'm going to provide an example or two, and for some of them we'll actually do an exercise to try and um, close that vulnerability in our code. So I have a basic project there with uh, products. So you already cloned the repository, you did the composer install, um, you need to edit the .env uh, file with the configuration of your MySQL database. And then, uh, I believe I put the instructions to create the database and run the migrations. Yeah, okay, so you run the... Hmm? Yeah, okay, I just, I don't remember what I put there, but uh, Doctrine Database Create and Doctrine Migrations Migrate is going to set it up for you. And then you just type bin console server colon run. So server colon run is going to start a Symfony server and you just copy the URL and put it into your browser and you should have a server running. Do you have that running in your browser? Okay, so... Can people raise their hands if they have it running in their browser? So one, two, there's more than two people in the room. What about the others? Either you're not listening <laughs> or, or you haven't got it to, to run yet. In progress. in progress? Okay, that's fine. So I'll, I'll keep talking. You try to pay attention at the same time if you can. And, uh, and for the first exercise, we're going to take a little longer if somebody has a little problem with their um, setup. And then, uh, and then we can code. So injection flaws. Uh, there are different types of injections, but really very common ones are SQL injections. And a lot of people tell me, Anna, why do you talk about this? Like all the developers here know about SQL injection. Well, yes, but at the same time, it is after I don't know how many years, it is still the most common vulnerability ever. And I've seen big websites still do that mistake. I'm like, oh. I just let me just type this, and suddenly, suddenly I can I can access more data that, than they um, expected. So let me open this in the browser and try to pull it on the other side. I think I'll just mirror my displays for this part, so I don't have to look up all the time. All right, so SQL injection, and I really made it. Uh, step by step. Okay, this sucks. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> how does SQL injection work? The way it works is you have a URL here, and we're trying to access um, the first purchase, so a transaction in our database. So we want to view the details. So this is the code that gets it. Okay, so we're actually running like a perfect. Uh, perfectly vanilla um, query, and we're taking the, the user ID, and we're displaying everything for that user. Okay, so one is the user ID. We're taking it from the URL, we're sticking it into our query, and that is how a lot of people are still doing this. The problem with that is, I don't know if you can see at the bottom, basically instead of one, I'm going to put in the URL one or one, like or the, the word. And what it's going to do with the same code is it's going to display things for all the users. So I would see transactions that do not belong to me. Okay, so here it is, all of that. And that's a problem. So Because what happens is it just sticks that into the query and executes the query, whatever it may be. You can even enhance it with a semicolon and then executing a second query. And you can drop the table. So XKCD had a nice comic about this uh, with uh, little Bobby tables. Basically, they named their, their child with the semicolon and everything, and they dropped the table students. So when the child grew up and went to a uh, university, they got registered, and the query dropped all of their students table. So yeah, I mean, it's a, a, 
a very long-term prank. <laughs> um, so that's the, that's the joke. And this happens still very often because people, they don't use prepared statements or they don't bind their, they don't bind their um, parameters. So <clears throat> if I go back to my slides, I need to exit this. Right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to fix that code uh, to, make it, um, to make it not display all of the purchases, even if you enter one or one. So the code that you're looking for is located, so it's under source controller injection controller. And what you have is the beginning of a method that is the fixed version of the method, and I just want you to write whatever is missing there to fetch the purchases, but in a safer way. All right? So I'm going to give you a few minutes to do that. I'm going to go around and make sure everybody has everything set up, and that was bound to happen eventually. And then if you don't find the solution, that's, that's fine. We'll, I'll just show it afterwards. Okay, let me see. All right, so I'm going to show you the solution. The solution is, basically you need to first <coughs> prepare the statement. And there are several ways to do it, but basically you can prepare the statement with uh, a parameter. And what you do is you execute it with the parameter so, uh, so this is the same key, and the value is whatever you received from the user. So what happens in this situation is that there is no way for the user to modify the meaning of the query. So if anything goes beyond a single value, um, it just it doesn't it doesn't count. Converts that to a number, and that's it. So if I can show you now the, I need to, how do I exit presentation? There's no shortcut for the presentation mode. That's a bit annoying. Okay, so here's the same page. It says now fixed. So one or one with this code that I showed you a moment ago. See, with that parameter here, instead of concatenating, use a parameter and that prevents the query from changing its meaning. Therefore, you will still see for the first user. You can additionally check, if you want, in the beginning, whether it's a number, so you can, especially in Symfony, you can specify what sort of parameters are accepted, so you can filter that at this level. But again, you need several layers, because you only need to forget once for somebody to be able to get through. So if you always use this approach, then you will be fine. So nobody will be able to inject something into your query. And I'm actually going to show you another example. So the same, the, the same uh, thing, but done in the Symfony way, which is much simpler than going through the, the query as we seen earlier. View, enter presentation mode, there we are. So this is the same thing, but in the Symfony way. And you don't need to do any of those uh, parameters there. You just find by in the repository, just find by and give the user the ID. And that's it. So it's a one-liner. It's going to, under the hood, it's going to create a prepared statement, and it's going to bind the parameters so you're pretty safe. So as long as you use an ORM with parameters like that and you don't concatenate everything, you should be fine. So that's the more basic example of an injection flaw. So that was the exercise. Let's move on to the next. Uh, so would you like a break before lunch or do you want to go until lunch and then maybe we'll take a break later before the end of the day? Anyway, if somebody needs to step out, we can call a break at any time. 
Yeah, so this is this is the joke I mentioned earlier on XKCD. I didn't see a t-shirt for that yet, but uh, I really hope there's a t-shirt for that. It's a really good one. Because I remember at a user group, I made a presentation and I mentioned prepared statements. And the guy kind of comes to me at the end and says, I never heard of those things. Because a lot of people just learn to code you know, on their own by looking at other people's code, which wasn't necessarily the best code. I remember I started coding when I was taking apart PHP BB back when it was written in PHP 3. So obviously not the best example of code that I could look at. Well, I mean, by today's standards, of course. Uh, back then, it made sense. So there are, uh, people think, okay, so if we just filter all of our input from the user, then we're safe, right? Well, no, that's why I'm talking about security layers. You can have stored injections. It means that somebody managed to store something in the database so that when later you use it as a trusted source for your query, then you can make them. They can you assume you can assume that the data that's in there is safe. Then you're going to concatenate, and you're going to have the same injection problem, right? So it's like a one one extra step. So instead of directly giving you the bad input, they maybe put something funky in their username, so that when you query something by username, you're going to have an injection happening there. So basically, that uh, Bobby Tables is an example of a stored injection. Because you give it to them, they, they store it, and then the first query they execute, it's going to cause a problem. Um, it's with all sorts of queries, right? Every time you use any sort of, of language, uh, any string that you pass that is going to be um, parsed into, into some, sort, some sort of executable code, like LDAP, uh, commands, you can have XPath, NoSQL, it doesn't really matter. As long as you have a string that represents a command, you can have an injection. Same thing for uh, command line interface, you can have those commands, you can have injections, really anything. OS commands, SMTP headers, expression languages, anything, XML parsers. I'm actually going to have a nice example on uh, injection through nicely crafted XMLs. Uh, like everything you consume, any file you read, it's, it's all a potential threat. There's so many ways people found to exploit those. So from in the internal sources, username upon registration, um, can also affect things on the admin side. So maybe you won't immediately see something, but that username will be able to do something in your admin side, like install a keylogger, depending what the length of the input is. Maybe it's not the username, maybe it's some comment somebody wrote, and then it shows up in the admin section, and then it does something nasty. Um, XML parsers, a uh, whole category. Um, so these lists that I provide of different vectors, they're not exhaustive, okay? In this list grows all the time. So it's just a few examples, things to watch out for, and just basically trust nothing. So the solutions for the type, old types of injections are usually first to examine the code. Of course, if you read the code, if you understand what it does, if you take the time to understand what it does, you should be fine, you, you should be able to spot any, any of those vulnerabilities, as long as you're familiar with them. So this is a lot, uh, a workshop about familiarizing yourself with all the ways that people can get into your system. And if you, you know enough of them, you can, you can prevent them, you can spot those things later in the code. That's why we have a bit of hands-on examples, so you can get a feel for it a bit and see next time, oh, I'm concatenating, so maybe I shouldn't do that. So just get this sort of reflex going. Um, keep the untrusted data separate from any commands and queries. So your database is not really trustworthy. Any file you write is not, is not necessarily trustworthy. Somebody would have, could craft something so that when you write the file, it becomes bad and then cause more problems like a ripple effect. You can have a whitelist validation, which is helpful. So if you're using any sort of uh, command words uh, that you pass to your queries, you might want to whitelist them. So if you, let's say you create, um, in, I, I know some, um, some companies, they have these products where they, um, they store data in different tables, in different formats, uh, or in similar formats, so they just need to substitute the table name. And so that table name becomes a variable. And 
what they sometimes fail to do is to whitelist that. So what can you put in that variable? So first go through that, make sure that nobody has tampered with that. Right? Sometimes it maybe it comes from the database that the table name that you need to put into your query. So you might need to concatenate it anyway. But still you whitelist that. So only these table names are allowed. Everything else is not. Uh, if you use an ORM or ODM, so ODM is like for the documents, like MongoDB. So if you use any of those, uh, like Doctrine, um, what's the other one, Lumen, I think it's called. If you use any of those, then you are relatively safe because they do have those things by default. They, they prepare the statements and they bind the, the parameters. And yeah, escape user supplied input. And you have to learn the different uh, escaping mechanism because some people still just you know add slashes and call it a day. It's not how it works. You really have to know the type of input you're dealing with and what kind of injection exists for that input. And if not, there's probably libraries for that. So usually using libraries is a very safe bet. So yeah, escape or convert any uh, potentially dangerous characters and strip out emojis because you don't want emojis in your input. I'm just kidding. Um, so the, the solution, the prepared statements is um, a means to prevent the attacker from changing the intent of a query and make it systematic because you will forget eventually. So make sure you always use that. Don't just um, custom create that every time. By using an ORM, usually um, you'll, be, uh, you'll be rather safe. You won't make that mistake once in a, once in a hundred times. Uh, buffer overflows. So those are a bit trickier to exploit and also trickier to understand. Buffer overflows are a way to basically corrupt a part of the memory that is going to be used in execution to cause unexpected side effects in an application. Um, so this happens when you don't properly check you know, which memory is available to which application or user. You don't sandbox things correctly and you just allow people to read any kind of memory uh, by trusting you know, the first layer. And yeah, that can cause side effects. And it happens all the time, especially in desktop applications. Like if you go through, like Microsoft Office has you know, buffer overflow through some macros. Things like that. So there's always um, there are always vulnerabilities listed online, and there's always patches for that. That's why they update so often. So uh, Heartbleed is actually uh, an example from that category. And the way it worked, if anyone remembers Heartbleed, that was when OpenSSL um, had a had a massive vulnerability discovered. So basically, um, what you see here is sort of like a uh, session keep alive, so it pings the server once in a while to check its availability. And what it does is it gives like a challenge and says, well, um, this is actually a good description. So server, are you still there? If so, uh, reply potato. And you give the length of, of the reply, six letters. It's like, okay, he's going to put potato in his memory and he's going to give you back the six characters for that. And you do that again. And are you still there? Um, and now it's going to say, well, uh, give me a reply hat, but it's 500 letters. So it didn't actually check the length of the provided input to constrain how much data it's going to return back. So now you start reading, you have hat, but you have everything else in memory that's being read and returned. So you can use that to basically have access to the entire memory, so everything there unencrypted. So you can have access to, to all that. Basically defies the whole purpose of the, um, of the protocol. So this is a malformed um, uh, heartbeat request. So heartbeat is to make sure that it's still, the, the, the service is still alive. Okay, it wasn't the worst music to hear at the workshop. <laughs> So this is a buffer overflow type of error. Um, a similar approach can be also used to push stuff into the memory. So this is like reading memory, but you can also push things into memory to change the execution 
Um, and it, it just takes some, a while to figure it out, but then people can download those kits from the internet and attack a whole bunch of vulnerable applications. So you can, you can change the way an application executes. And places where it has been discovered, in the TAR archives, um, in GD images, in EXIF data, that's for, like, um, for the photos, you know, like the shutter speed and all that metadata um, that you can read from an image file. Um, any sorts of strings basically can, can have that. You, what you do is you send clever input to various extensions in the hopes that it does, um, it corrupts the memory in the way that you, um, that you, that you want it. So you hope that they do not handle that specific memory related scenario. So you just try different things and eventually stumble upon something interesting like with uh, Heartbleed. So the impact is actually huge. It's, it's harder to, to manage. You really have to search for it. But once you find it, it's a gold mine. You can execute arbitrary code. You can corrupt memory addresses causing a crash, right? Because it tries to read something. There's nothing there. Like, oh my God, everything crashes. You can expose sensitive data. So you can cause any type of, of problem. Um, the solutions for that is uh, to validate boundaries. In PHP, we're a bit less exposed to that because PHP sort of handles a lot of that out of the box. So your code itself, the PHP code itself, is rather safe. So the PHP code you write is safe. What you need to worry about are the extensions that you're using, which are written in a different language that does not handle all of these scenarios out of the box. So people have to think about that. So if somebody made a mistake in their extension, and you're still using, let's say, a vul uh, an older vulnerable version of that extension, you might be at risk. Like, for example, Image Magic had uh, a problem like that some time ago. So you need to make sure to update software and libraries on time. That is very important. Right, uh, insecure cryptographic storage. Uh, did I have an example for that one? No, um, OK, we're good. Yeah, because the example wouldn't be in, in PHP anyway. So just update your stuff. Insecure cryptographic storage. Of course, you will not use plain text. Thank you. Um, you would probably also not use just a basic hash, right? Because those are pointless these days uh, because of rainbow tables. I mean, some, uh, some of the algorithms are a bit harder, but still, you can generate rainbow tables. That's actually kind of fun. Uh, what you do, you know, so rainbow tables would usually be created for um, MD5 or SHA-1. So how does it work? Let's say I want to create a rainbow table. I'm an attacker. So what I do is I create all the string permutations. So let's say you say uh, on your website it says, oh, your password has to be a maximum of eight characters. Awesome. That's actually helpful. Oh, it cannot contain any special characters. That's nice, too, because that constrains how many permutations I have. So I go and I calculate all the permutations. Once I have that, I apply, let's say, the MD5 algorithm on that, the MD5 hash, and I calculate the hash that corresponds to it. And I store it in, in a database. I create a table for that, where the index, uh, the, the, on one side we have the key, which is the hash that I calculated, and on the other side is the plain text that's used for the hash, which means that if I have this hash, this is going to be the plain text that corresponds to it. And people say, hey, but what about um, collisions? Well, collisions are very unlikely. It's, I mean, already it's very hard to find collisions for that. And at the same time, for something two strings of eight characters long do not have collisions. So that's already proven. Okay, so they're like too short to have collisions. So that's it. So you store all of that, and when you're ready, you steal a password hashes, or you just buy them from some places, and then you look them up in the table, and you can basically decode the plain text version. So it's not really safe. So not only the uh, not only let's say your um, database security failed, somebody got into your database and they steal the hashes and you think they're secure? Well, they're not. And you don't even need to create your own rainbow tables. You can download them 
It's, it's, it's really simple. Like today you can download all the toolkits for all the things you want to do. So you want to attack a website, it's really simple. I don't do that. <laughs> Although I could. Sometimes I go to a website and like, oh, it's just too easy. Don't make it so easy. It's almost tempting. So for a length of uh, one to seven characters, the table size is just 52 gigabytes. Um, if it's one to eight characters, it's 460 gigabytes. But that's for the full ASCII, right? If you want just, you know, mixed alphanumeric characters, then it really shrinks the size of the database that you need to download. And so if people constrain the characters, constrain the, the length of the password that is possible, it really makes things simple. So uh, it, by picking alphanumeric, you just make the database 3.6 times smaller. So we actually have a rainbow table in our code. A rather simple one, because I didn't want to <laughs> load your machines with a huge uh, 127 gigabytes. So we're going to go back to the home page. Let me mirror. So the exercise won't be about writing it, but I'm going to show you how it works. So <clears throat> I have a database with a couple of hashes in there. And I'm going to, let's say those are the hashes that I have access to. So I, I stole those from, a, from somewhere. And I press search. And for each one, it's going to try and find the plain text equivalent. right? So my database would contain this corresponds to this, this corresponds to that, because I pre-calculated them. And actually did this one manually, because it was so simple. So this is how I do it. I just explode by line uh, all the hashes, and I find them in the table, and I just output. It's just two lines of code. It's, it's rather simple, once you have access to the database. So that's all you need to know about rainbow tables. That's how they work. Now, back to our slides. So we talked about passwords. I mentioned collisions, you know, with that's password length strings. It just doesn't exist. You need a lot more characters to start getting any collisions. And even with something as simple as MD5, uh, so far I've only seen one collision, and it's just way too long a string to bother. So you shouldn't have to worry about that. So the solution is to salt your hashes. Okay, so how does the salt work? Is you create an additional random key that is only used for that particular password. So it's not like one key that unlocks everything, it's one per password. And you, you, um, you salt and hash both of them at the same time. Okay, and then you store the salt in another field, and then you can, you can basically reverse calculate the, the hash. So when you have the plain text, you take the salt, you calculate that together, and you arrive at the same hash that you have stored in your database. Um, so, and then what that creates is a lot more permutations. Because when in the past you had to generate rainbow tables, you know, you had a one-to-one -one correspondence. Now for every plain text permutation, you have all these additional permutations because of the key, and the key is rather long. And another level is repeated hashing. So I'm going to show that in a moment. But first, I remember I had a question from the audience uh, before break. The question was, how do you grab all of those hashes, like the real passwords? How do you grab them? Like, where do you get them? So there are multiple ways. One of them is buying a leaked database. So whenever somebody steals a database, they're going to try and monetize that. So they're going to go around and try to sell it to people. Sometimes pretty cheap, you know, like a few cents per, uh, per, per record. So for a few thousand, you can get like a really huge database. Um, so your, the, the data is actually pretty, pretty, sold pretty cheap. They don't make that much money out of it. Um, the other way is to intercept passwords if the forms are not protected. It's a bit harder and it, it, is, it takes a longer time. It's usually people go the, the, the route of trying to steal the whole database, 
then ha have the whole list and then decode that in a batch and have access to all of this. And of course, people, because they reuse their passwords, the same combination can be valid on other sites. So when you get breached and you only hash your stuff, you're not just hurting your business, you're hurting everyone else. So repeated hashing, how does that work? So what, what is the goal of, of repeated hashing? The goal is to slow down the attacker, right? Make sure that it takes them too many resources to calculate those hashes than is practical. Okay, so if you make it really easy, like without hashing or any, uh, without salting, right? Plain text is simple, then you hash, that costs a lot more resources than to, to, to decode. If you salt your hashes, that's a lot more resources again. But people have access to resources. I mean, all of those leftover GPUs from Bitcoin miners, um, they're going to they're gonna be really cheap. So people are going to have access to a lot of computational power. And so what we do is we try to, in addition to solve the hash, we make we compound that by making multiple iterations. So how does that work? We start, so we rehash. We start with a plain text password, ABC, for example. Then we generate a salt and we hash it. We generate a salt, then w f with that, we generate a salt and we hash it again and again and again. And we can do that, say, we're not talking about five or six times. We're talking about maybe 20,000 times. So we do that many times. And that's, that's pretty costly. Let's say it takes, I don't know, 0.5 seconds to do that. But for us, it's not really a big deal. Let's say somebody logs in and we have to calculate the, the, the hash 20,000 times to arrive at the same, um, at the same result. So when we're, we're taking the plain text from the, from the user and we hash it, it takes us 0.5 seconds. For us, it's not a big deal because it's a small slowdown during login and then we're good to go. But for the person who's trying to generate a rainbow table or trying to calculate, uh, perform the same calculation in a large, uh, on a large scale, that 0.5 seconds is extremely costly. So you're really hurting those people by doing that. So for you, it makes a little difference, but for the person trying to guess a password, it makes things ridiculously hard, or rather very slow. So we take a very long time to do that. So the hashing demo. So you have a couple of examples here. I'm going to mirror. I'm going to show you the examples for that. Uh, so I did a bit of a benchmark of passwords, because the idea is to slow down the attackers. Let's say we have a plain text that is three characters long, right? So we generate some plain text and we, uh, we hash 1,000 passwords like that. And just, just with MD5, like this, you see? And that only takes 0 0.03 seconds. It's, it's actually pretty fast, you know? So calculating permutations using MD5 is actually rather cheap. So you can create those rainbow tables yourself, no problem at all. Okay, but let's say we go with MD5 and salt. What we do here now is we even increase uh, the plain text. Okay, we create those random bytes. Uh, I think that's a mistake, but we're actually you know, creating um, 16 random bytes. So we create 100,000 passwords again but because we're adding the extra salt, okay, so those bytes are, are salt. Um, sorry, this is, our, um, this is our plain text. And then this is how we calculate our salt. And then we concatenate the two. Okay, we can concatenate the plain text with the salt and we hash it. And just this makes it much slower. You see, instead of 0 0.0, 37 we end up with 0.19 but still not really that bad i mean we only increase it a few times so the solution here is to use some more advanced algorithms that do the repeated hashing and it's called bcrypt 
Uh, there are other um, things you can use other than Bcrypt, but Bcrypt is pretty pretty standard. Uh, you, you have a really nice extension for that. So, and what's really nice also is that um, since uh, actually quite a few years ago already, there are some functions that have been written for PHP called password hash. So you can create passwords and you can do password verify. And it basically takes away all the legwork, all the boilerplate code you need to write to generate those hashes and compare them. Just takes the pain away. What you do here, once again, plain text. Uh, but this time I'm going to only hash one password because we increased the cost so much that like if I would calculate a hundred thousand of them, it's gonna it's gonna take a while for this page to show up. So I reduce from a hundred thousand to just one, and we are already at point twelve. So we considerably slowed it down. How did we do that? We introduced uh, well, we use bcrypt. Password default is going to be bcrypt in this case. So we say let's hash it with the default algorithm, and we're going to introduce a cost. And the cost, basically, each time you increment by one, you roughly double the time it takes to calculate. So it just increases the number of iterations that it does. So remember the diagram? You salt, calculate the hash, salt, calculate the hash, salt the result, calculate, and so forth. And you do that as many times as necessary. And this cost can be increased any time. And that's what, what's interesting. So here we have point 12, and let's just increase it to 14, and it's going to take a while. And we have 1.83, so that's almost two seconds of calculation. But see, this hasn't changed. The only thing that changed here is the cost. So the cost is in the URL. Don't put, it, don't put 20 in there, it's going to take a while, um, unless you really want to use your resources for nothing. So what you can do is, depending on the, the server that's calculating these hashes, you can just keep increasing. So as computers become more and more performant, you can increase that cost to something that is acceptable to you. So let's say something that takes, say, say your threshold is 0.5 seconds to calculate that for your users, otherwise it's gonna slow down your, uh, your users. Uh, you can just increase that so that it's 0.5 and use that cost. And as you migrate to a more performance server, you can increase that. So you can actually put that in your configuration file, uh, put it in an environment variable, and just change it whenever you feel like it. And what's really nice with those password hash functions and password verify is the, the, the string that you get out of it contains all the information needed to verify it as well. So you only need to store you only need one column in the database to store all of that. It has your, it, it has your, um, uh, it specifies the algorithm. So basically, it's like positionally, it says, well, the first few characters define the algorithm. This is the actual content, and this is the cost. So it's gonna do the calculation. It's gonna take care of everything. So you don't need to have like in the past, you know, you had the password column in your database, and you had the hash. Um, this, uh, the, the, the salt um, column in your database. So it's just one column, store it there. Um, password hash when you initially create it from the plain text, and then password verify by sticking the user input and then whatever you have in your database. And it's going to tell you whether it is the same or not. So it's super simple in your code. So if you, uh, if you want, you can play with that in your code. You could try different algorithms, uh, but we're going to move forward. We're going to skip the exercise. Because if we do the exercises, we're not going to get through the 12 categories. And this is the third. So um, yeah, with password, uh, password hash and password verify, it does all the grunt work for you. Pick the cost, increase whenever you feel like it. You can put it, bring it back, uh, bring it up, bring it back down anytime. Um, each individual password in your system can be encoded using a different number of iterations, so you don't have to worry about that. 
But in addition to that, so since we're on the topic of passwords, uh, don't limit the number of, and type of characters. And when I say don't limit the number, I don't mean like make it a, a, a gigabyte. You know, don't allow a gigabyte in your password. Put something uh, reasonable, like I don't know, maybe 500 characters. If somebody wants to have a, like a really long auto-generated password, just let them. Okay, the longer the better, as long as it calculates rather quickly on your side. Uh, there's no need to limit it to eight. Uh, whenever somebody limits that on the website to eight, I immediately assume that they store it in a plain, uh, plain text in a var char, you know, like eight. That, that's what I assume. So by doing that, the, the more uh, different types of characters you allow, so if you allow all the special characters and you allow longer characters, it's just going to make it much harder to create a rainbow table and also uh, brute force is going to be so much more difficult because you're going to have to go through so many iterations. Because if you, if you do limit them, the attackers just need to know the length, download the appropriate um, rainbow table, and they're good to go. I mean, those rainbow tables get pretty big, but still, if they know your cost, they can extrapolate from that. Security questions are notoriously insecure. <laughs> and when I see banks use them, I just facepalm. Because security, so, so what is security? It's something you, something you know, something you own, or something you are. Uh, security questions like, what was your first car? Uh, which school did you go to? That is known by so many people. Everybody who went to school with you knows what school you went to. So if somebody asks this as a question to log into your bank account, that's pretty easy to guess, you know? Which city you were born in? It says so on your passport even, you know? Like, it's, it's so easy. So it is known by a wide group of people, therefore it is inherently insecure, right? The whole concept of that. Um, and then, of course, you're storing more private data. And if you are storing that data in plain text, that's even worse, because now somebody steals the entire database, Especially there's a bank I know that asks you for five different security questions and they make you pick from a list. And so now you have answers to five security questions. If that database gets leaked, now somebody knows five pieces of information about you that they can use on all the other sites to get through without any, um, without any constraints. So, and that data is actually valuable. It can get sold because eventually they can aggregate and it's like, here's all the information about this person. Now you can answer all the security questions you want because they overlap a lot, you know, like your mother's maiden name. It's everybody knows that. I mean, after a while, because everybody asks for it. Everybody stores it in the database. So yeah, answering security questions on other, si uh, on other sites is a big problem. Uh, another problem with the credit cards is, I mean, it's really hard to secure them properly and you cannot just hash them. You actually need to make it something reversible. So one way to avoid all the hassle is actually to use a credit card vault. So if you're using a payment gateway to process your credit card uh, transactions, they usually have a vault. Any self-respecting gateway now has a vault. So if you're using Stripe, you're using PayPal, you're using Authorize.net, whatever, uh, they all have vaults. And the way it works, and it's really nice because you actually never touch the real credit card number. You as the application. So from the browser, for example, the way Stripe works is from the browser, the person types the credit card number, but it doesn't go to your server. They don't submit. Uh, when they submit, it initially goes through an uh, Ajax request, it goes to the vault, it goes to the payment gateway, submits it there, and it gets stored, and then a token is returned and added to a hidden field on your form. So the credit card number is never actually submitted through the form. The only thing they, the user submits to your server is going to be the token. And the token is like basically just an identifier. So paired with your own API token, those two can be used to process the charge. So what you have is an identifier 
of data that is stored in the vault there. And they're usually pretty secure. So you get that token, and then the user presses submit, and then, you uh, then what you do is you send the token and the amount you want to charge to the payment gateway. So at no point do you touch the credit card number, which is really nice. And if you are going to query, because they have an API, so you can query for the, the information on the user, uh, on the credit card with the token, you only get a partial back. You'll never get the plain text. So even developers with full access, all the API keys, they will never see the actual credit card number anywhere. It's never visible, which is much safer. And you can still use that partial, you know, to print it on receipts, to confirm things with your users, so you're going to give it to your uh, account managers if they need to contact uh, your customers. Uh, you can, you can um, yeah, so devs can't even get the full number. But the thing you have to be careful with, uh, because some people still, there are two ways. There's the way through the uh, Ajax request, but you can still get it submitted um, to your site. I mean, there's always a way to design your stuff so that uh, the credit card number gets submitted. If you do that for whatever reason, avoid sessions. And that's something I saw uh, with a lot of um, websites where they have like this multi-step checkout process. Let's say they're signing up for a new telephone plan. So they need like one page to choose their plan and all the options, a second page for the billing information, third page for the confirmation and payment method, things like that. And they store things into the session so that it follows them through the different steps. And if you put the plain text in the session, it is the same as putting it plain text in your database. Because where is your session stored? It's stored in memory, it's stored uh, so in RAM, that's still insecure, it's stored in a database, it's stored maybe in a file if you still use files for sessions. So it's going to, going to be stored there for a certain period of time in an insecure way. So you avoid sessions by only carrying around the token. So get the token, throw away the credit card information, just keep the token and put that into your session if you have to. Can you send that, um, you send that directly to the vault. And in the multi-step checkout, let's say somebody entered their credit card information and they go back to the page and they want to edit their credit card information, you don't display the plain text directly to them. You can just do a little thing like that where you display the partial and if, you, if they click edit, they just have to retype the whole thing and that is how most websites nowadays work. So that's, that's a perfectly fine approach. And this way you never have to worry about losing that data. There are places where you might get credit card numbers stored that you did not plan for. For example, when people order something online uh, with delivery, for example, they might enter some sort of instructions, you know? Um, and sometimes I've seen with uh, a telecom company where people would say, can you charge like half of it on this card and half of it on that card? And they put it in the comment in plain text. So it does get stored in your database in plain text, just not in the field you expected. Or sometimes the, um, the account admins, they, they call up users and they change something and they keep a log of the communication with the customer and they're gonna say, oh, we changed to this credit card number. Like, they don't think about security, so you have to think about security for them. I mean, you can train them, but you need that extra layer where you can basically detect the patterns, so you can scan those plain text fields, like those comments and stuff, and you strip out the plain text data. So if you find something that looks like a credit card number, you strip it out of there before you store it to your database. And this way you're going to be much safer. So basically, there are so many places where you can end up with those numbers inadvertently. All right, so that's for the credit cards and in, uh, insecure cryptographic storage. Let's talk about insecure communications. Um, doesn't really have anything to do with PHP specifically. Uh, however, it is a major category. So data can be stolen from a database, but it can also be stolen in transit especially if you don't uh, use SSL. 
So it can be stolen in transit, whenever it's on your server, in your database, in backups, wherever you might store your um, any sort of valuable information. And it can be stored on the client end too. You can inadvertently put things in cookies, in the browser, you know, within the cache, things like that. So data can be exposed, you know, in transit or at rest. So first thing is SSL all the things. I mean, that is, that is the, the basic principle of it. So it's rather simple. SSL everything. A few notes. Um, when you are developing mobile applications, and that may change, you know, depending on the platform, but um, some mobile applications by default, they don't require SSL chain verification. Um, so you might want to enable that to make sure that your communications are as secure as possible. Uh, you can refuse self-sign certificates as well. So in developer mode, maybe it's going to show a warning or something, or just you know um, reject it altogether. But you probably want to refuse self-sign certificates. Uh, the other thing is there are other channels where you can send things that do not go through um, through the browser. So, for example, if you send an email, it can go to any sort of client. Maybe it's fetched through a server that itself does not do it in a secure manner. So maybe you send it through SSL to the other server, but then the other server provides the email to the user um, without SSL. So the email is potentially exposed. And SMS is potentially exposed. And all of these other third-party channels uh, that you don't control, they can expose the data. So, you know, people who reset their password, but instead they just receive the password by email, um, that's, that's a big problem because you just, you just exposed it. And people, we know, they reuse their passwords. So even if they change it on this website, um, they might have used the same password somewhere else. So, um, and the other thing is, and I've seen uh, mostly in the financial industry, what they do is on top of SSL, they also use their own encryption. So they encrypt things and then they sell it, send it through SSL because what if SSL fails? And we had a good example a few years back with Heartbleed, um, it failed. So things were potentially exposed and if you are dealing with bank information, then you probably cannot afford that. So if the information is sensitive enough, you have to be, you have to be extra careful. Also, I know they, there's, I don't know if there's still talk about this in the US, but they're still trying to get like this master key for all the SSL communications. So if that ever goes through, um, your communications are now potentially insecure. So if you want to keep that from them, you want to have your own encryption and then send it over SSL as a second layer. Improper error handling. I actually have a friend who has a, a big collection of error messages found in the wild. So every time, every time I see something, I also snap a picture and send it to him to add to his collection. So improper error handling, pretty basic leak information with detailed error messages. The more detailed, the better for the attacker. Stack traces, I mentioned that, it's really fun. You can find so much useful information in there, like all the paths you can use. Account enumeration, that is, say you want to do a password reset, okay, and you're going to type in the email and it's going to tell you too much information like, oh, sorry, this account doesn't exist. Oh, okay, so does this one exist? Yes, okay, so this user is registered on this website, good to know, right? So this is too, giving people too much information. Um, other ways you can give too much information is by let's say, exposing transaction numbers. So for example, let's say you have the transaction number in your URL, and if I type any other transaction number that doesn't exist, it's gonna tell me 404 not found, but maybe it exists but doesn't belong to me, it's gonna say access denied. Oh, so you make a distinction, which means that it does exist. That's also good to know, because then there are other attacks I can show you where that information becomes suddenly very valuable to know that something exists in the database can be, uh, can be very useful. So order numbers, 
uh, the fact that some admin pages exist, instead of telling people, sorry, this page doesn't exist. No, it exists, but we just don't give you access. Oh, so you have PHP my admin installed. So that means maybe you have a port open, like what else can I, can I find in there, right? So it just gives you a lot of information. So the solution is, of course, you turn off the debug mode. You can tune your security settings. So usually frameworks, they have different uh, security settings that you just flip, you know, you flip to production mode and it already tunes your security settings for, for that to avoid, you know, showing too much information, debug mode. Um, the, instead, you're going to show some custom error pages, you know, with the proper design. Um, and when you are yourself, um, when, when you are yourself sending uh, information back to the browser, you can tune, like, you can return generic error messages. So instead of saying um, access denied, you can just say 404 not found, right? So, uh, or you can say, you, you can return the proper uh, HTTP status codes, things like that. Basically, don't disclose anything unless the user really needs to know. Don't tell them more than they need to know. Just keep as much information to yourself as possible. They don't need to know that this page exists, but just not for them. Like, as far as they're concerned, this page does not exist. So just send them that information. Cross-site scripting. Actually, one of the easiest ones to exploit, uh, still very common, extremely common, um, it's a high risk vulnerability because, not just because it's easy to exploit, but because you can cause so much damage by running um, scripts that people are, did not intend. Because JavaScript can do a lot of damage. So I'm going to show you an XSS demo. This one doesn't work on Chrome because it's a very basic XSS, very straightforward. So Chrome has detection for that. Uh, Firefox doesn't, a little, at least not yet. So I'm going to show you. Luckily, we have um, Firefox on the on the box there. I'm just going to mirror my display, right? So we're going to send this, and we're going to send it raw. Yes, we got hacked. This is the alert that we got. So any type of JavaScript can be uh, if it's submitted and it goes straight to the output without any filtering. Um, yeah, it can cause all sorts of uh, problems. So the fixed version of that, basically this one is so simple that I won't even force you to, to, to do it. See, here I, I'm using a template in Twig, and I'm just using raw. Uh, if you are using straight PHP, then you probably by default don't have protection, while in frameworks by default you do have protection. So you have to use a filter to say raw to basically not filter it. And then fi fixing it basically implies just displaying it right away. But in PHP, if you display it like that, if you want in pure PHP to protect yourself against such attacks, what you want to do is encode the HTML entities. Can you show this in Chrome, please? Yes. Now you're curious. Uh, can I? Let me check, because um, I don't know if this one, I don't think it accesses the database, so we should be fine. Uh, open console server run. Can you see it? Yeah. Can you see it well? Yeah. Chrome detected unusual code on this page and blocked it to protect your personal information. And you see by the, the code here, XSS. So it actually detects it. Not any fancy, you know, stored uh, stuff, but it can still, like, it detected that you submitted something that contained JavaScript and then you display it right away. It compared the it two, it's like, oh, that's like too straightforward, so it doesn't work. All right, uh, actually, let me go back to my slides at this point. So you have all the examples in the, in the repository, and also you have all the solutions. So for every exercise that we did, 
you can look up the solutions. There's a branch called solutions, so you just can look it up if you, if you don't want to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the exercises themselves rather quickly. And if you want at home, you can just you know, start from scratch and try the exercises again. Right, so preventing an XSS attack nowadays is actually very simple, very straightforward. As long as you use a framework that has a templating engine, you are probably safe. Now, the impact, if you don't protect yourself against it, and a lot of people don't, is that somebody can hijack the session, because you know they can read cookies and stuff, um, they can deface your website, they can you know, make things appear on your site, they can modify the document object model, and they can basically transform your website to anything they want. Um, because they can include JavaScript from somewhere else, that's why it's called cross-site scripting. You can just, uh, alert is a simple one, but you can just include a script, you store it somewhere else, and then you can pull in a whole bunch of code that would maybe otherwise not fit into the comments field. Uh, but then you can have an external script and it can be like megabytes large. You can uh, redirect people to websites that you don't want to get redirected to. Like for example, I organize a conference and somebody once uh, hacked it, not through XSS, but a different means. Somebody hacked it to occasionally redirect to a porn site. That was very unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, somebody really, I don't know, maybe, maybe a speaker got annoyed that they didn't get selected or something. It's like, ha ha ha. Right, but, and we fixed it. We fixed it within minutes, but um, it was very annoying because I had to get pulled away from a cocktail, you know, and I had to go handle this annoying problem. Uh, so you can also insert hostile content. That's actually pretty scary. Uh, and hostile content can be like phishing, you know, uh, key logging, uh, Bitcoin mining, which is also sort of hostile content because they're going to use your resources for their own uh, benefit. They can download malware behind your back. There are ways to, to make it pretty transparent. And again, any sort of injection, beware of stored injection. Somebody can somehow put data uh, into some source that you trust, and then you forget to filter it because you trust it, because it's already there. You think it's, it belongs to you, but somebody else managed to put something in there. Uh, so for malware, what they can do is use an iframe that points to a file somewhere and then you see a file pop and a person opens the zip and things happen. So the solutions is using a template engine, avoid raw filters uh, when the data is destined for output. So the, you know, uh, pipe raw, that was a, a transformation for your output to actually display the HTML part. <coughs> So you have to be careful. Um, try if you, I've, I see that a lot when people they they have JavaScript straight in their uh, page, and what they do is they take some input from the user and they put it into the um, into the JavaScript like serialize an object, you know, and they they shove it there, and that can be that can be dangerous because if you haven't filtered it, then you potentially execute something that you didn't intend. You think you're just putting a string into, into some, some property there on the page, but actually it breaks out, and a bit like an SQL injection, breaks out of it, executes, uh, includes another script, and then goes back to, um, goes back to uh, assigning the property. So don't pass that directly to JavaScript, or heavily sanitize, but of course avoiding that altogether is much safer if possible. So think of another approach to um, solve your problem. You have to escape depending on the context, so something I talked about in the injection uh, section. So they overlap a bit, those categories. So LDAP, XPath and stuff, um, you have to know your context to escape properly. And you can use content security policy. Uh, it's not entirely bulletproof, but it's actually quite nice. So let's say in Nginx we add a header called content security policy. And what we do is we tell the browser what it can and cannot do with what kinds of resources. So in this case, we say, okay, the default source, not script source, okay? So this, this means that if you have any script tag that fetches uh, JavaScript, 
if you fetch any scripts, you can only fetch from self. That means the same domain. You cannot fetch it from another domain. So you protect yourself from unwanted third-party scripts. So even if somebody manages somehow to put a script tag into your page that points to some other server, it's the browser will not fetch it because it has this policy. It says, no, I will only fetch it from the domain. Um, some browsers might even warn you about that if it happens. Um, connect source, image source, where do we fetch images from, where do we fetch styles from. So there's a whole bunch of those that you can, you can find. And you just add them all into the header and that should protect you from a lot of those nasty, um, nasty attacks. And that is your extra layer. So yes, you do try to sanitize input, but if you forget something somewhere, or if some, somebody who is, has less experience joins the project and forgets something, um, you plan for it, but the other one doesn't know, um, so you have a fallback. So always have multiple layers. Improper access control. This one is super easy to exploit. And I'm going to show you an example. Here's uh, what happens when you forget to check record ownership. Improper access control. So what we try uh, to do is to get purchase number one. And the mirror, yes. Purchase number one, here it is. ID, user ID, purchase amount. We assume that we're logged in as a user number one. So we find purchase ID one based on the URL. But let's say I try to fetch purchase number five. Purchase number five does not belong to me. But if I forget to check it and I just fetch it by ID, I mean, it's a rather simple mistake to make, but sometimes you know, when you have multiple abstraction levels, you lose track and you can end up with situations where something like this happens. This is, they all look very straightforward, but people end up making the mistake through, um, you know, they just lose track of what's happening. There's just too much code, too much legacy. Um, so they can make this mistake. So what we, what we need to do here, actually we can do an exercise for that to see how we can prevent that. So what I want you to do is to go into the controller called, is it ACL? I usually call them pretty straightforward. Hmm? ACL controller? Yeah. Okay, so go into the ACL controller, you'll find a, a second action there. Um, and it should basically, what I want you to do is fix this method to prevent a user from seeing someone else's data. Assume it's user number one. Uh, so just hard code user number one, that's fine. And um, instead of, there's two types of exceptions you can, you can throw. So if you see in the first method you have, actually let me show you what we're talking about. File name, ACL, controller. There we go. Oh no, there's a solution here. Whoops. No, no solution. <laughs> I don't want to show you the solution. Anyway, so in the ACL controller there you have, I'll just do like this, haha. <laughs> so in the ACL controller you have a create not found exception. Uh, I will enter presentation mode. So create not found exception is what you want because although you can do uh, an access denied exception, this um, infringes on the other uh, rule I showed you where you, you should not communicate too much information. As far as the user is concerned, that transaction will not exist. So I want you to check the ownership. So there's a second method there where you can go and, and fix it. So I'm gonna give you about uh, 10 minutes for that. you will see that the fixing part is actually rather straightforward. It's simpler than, than you might have thought in the beginning. And that is actually the whole point of those exercises. It's also to show you that it doesn't require much code to fix it. You just, as long as you are aware of the vulnerability, the countermeasure is often quite simple. Mm -hmm. 
really looks like everybody's quite finished. Anyone not finished? Okay, I will take that as a yes. All right, so, so the solution was actually quite straightforward. Let me show it to you. I'll put back the code I deleted. Uh, share my screen. So, of course, in our case, we did not have a, a user session, but otherwise, instead of one, we would have gotten the currently logged user. So all you need to do, really, is pretty much the same thing as before. The only difference is when you find it, you add the user as an additional filter, and then if it's not found, you just say not found, because as far as the user accessing this uh, purchase is concerned, this purchase does not exist. So it's, it's really quite straightforward. And of course, you can always have that uh, in some other layer where you first check you know, for the availability. There are many ways to do that, but in Symfony, it can get really complicated for the purpose of this example. So quite straightforward. Um, let me actually show you the code like you can, switching takes some time. So you can see it here, find one by, and if we go to the fixed one, um, we just add the user one and it should throw an exception. And of course, when you are in production, you won't see the stack trace, because uh, right now we're in development mode, but you would see like a proper page that you would design for your errors. All right, moving on to the next part. And we're actually slowly getting back on track. There was a, a bit of a slow start this morning, but uh, we're getting there. Actually, I thought we were going to start at nine until like a week before the event. So I thought I had like one extra hour, so I had to compress things a bit. So the solutions for uh, for this access control is, of course, if you expose sequential IDs, there's always a risk. It's not a, a must if you protect yourselves correctly, but if you avoid exposing those sequential IDs, uh, people will not just increment by one and expect that to exist. So you can just uh, generate uh, special IDs that are only visible to the user. You have your own internal IDs for the foreign keys, but then you can generate something um, specific for the user, anything that you would expose through the API. Um, <clears throat> so tokens, you can also, um, I don't remember what I wanted to say about tokens, but uh, longer hashes or combination, yes. So as opposed to IDs, you can use tokens, as I said, so you can have long hashes and you should, you should be able to um, protect yourself from people trying to just increment by one and try to steal all your data. So this combined with uh, having access to um, having the, the, the vulnerability where you don't correctly check for ownership, that would allow somebody to go and just increment by one and just save all the data to their computer. Is that understood? Okay. So you have to authenticate your users, filter uh, any data actions, check various roles and privileges. So just have this little cascade there, you know, where you check whether the person is supposed to access what they're accessing. And when you check roles and privileges, it's not always about whether you can or cannot access a record. You might have an extra layer where you might want to control what type of data about a record somebody can access. So let's say uh, a user can only see uh, the details of their transaction, such as you know the amount and items that they purchased, uh, but maybe somebody else uh, would be able to, like an admin, would be able to see more information, maybe about the payment method and what other things this user has purchased. So some, some columns you might not want to expose to everyone. So based on the roles and privileges, you can, you can filter not just which records, but which parts of the records are accessible. And that's more apparent if you, if you expose your data via an API. 
And of course, as usual, you review your code. You have to think about your ACL. It's something that you plan. It's not something that you just arrived later in the code and you say, okay, I'm going to do some, I'm going to stick some ACL in there. It's really, uh, this is the one thing where re you really have to plan in advance. You have to think about what are your roles and privileges, what users can access, and make sure to build your application around that. So that one cannot be an afterthought. And you can add it to your automated test suite. So if you use something like Behat, okay, where you write this Gherkin, um, then you can automatically test not only all the happy paths, you know, all the your, your, all the, scenario, the good scenarios, but you can say, okay, well, let's say I am uh, authenticating as user one with password one two three, so that will be ID one, right? And then I request purchases five, so basically reproducing the scenario I just showed you, then I should get a response 404. So you actually put that into your test suite, you put one of those scenarios for every action, for the different um, verifications that you do, and you make sure that it returns the status code that you expect it to return. And this way you automate your security, you put it right there in, in your test suite. Because it's very easy to say, all right, so I put this uh, ACL, I tested it once in the browser, it works, but you really need to make sure that in the future, especially, as I said, you often have these multiple layers of uh, uh, levels of abstraction where you can lose track of what's actually happening. So you make a little change here and it has a chain reaction and then suddenly something becomes exposed. And this is going to ensure that it's, it's going to stay secure. So if you run your test suite and you mess something up, it's going to come up as an error. It says your application does not work as expected. Fail test. And you can do that very early on. Even before you write any line of code for your application, you can already start thinking about your security this way. You write all these tests, and then when you write your controllers, you are sure that they are secure in the very early stages. So. I will have time for cross-site request forgery before lunch. Uh, will I? Let me check how many slides on this I have. Uh, actually, no, we have an exercise for that, so maybe we'll keep that for after lunch. So, do you want to go for an early lunch? But uh, I think it's impossible. What is impossible? Isn't that 12.30? Oh, that's right. Okay, yes. Okay, we'll continue then. I was pretty sure it was going to be at uh, 12.30, so I was aiming for that. Cool. All right, so we have time for an extra category. Awesome. So let's talk about cross-site uh, cross request forgery. These are a bit less obvious than the others, a bit like the uh, buffer overflows, you really need to think about them. Uh, but they're actually not that hard to exploit, uh, and you really have to think about your stuff if you want to protect yourself against them. So basically, what is cross-site request forgery? To summarize it, it is making a, a, a user of the site perform an action, inadvertently perform an action that they did not intend to perform. So it was not my intent by clicking that link to get a refund for my transaction, but it happened because something, somebody did something in there. So there are many ways to achieve that. This is one example. Let's say I am a user, I'm the victim here. I'm the user, I send my credential to the application, I log in, I check my stuff, and I just, I don't sign out, I just go away. And then some attacker, is going to send me a uh, discount link via email. It's going to say, hey, click here, and you're going to get a big discount on the site. And you're like, OK, I click. And what happens, because I am, as a user, already authenticated, if I am brought to the site through any link, I am going to perform any action that the URL states. So if the URL says cancel tickets one, two, three, and that is the ID of the ticket I'm canceling, What's well, going to cancel a ticket for me? And yeah, step four, profit. How do you profit from that? Let's say it's a sold out show. You send out a bunch of discount links. 
because maybe you guessed them through, uh, because it showed you denied instead of 404. So you're like, okay, these ideas exist, so I'm gonna send out a bunch of discount links, and somebody's gonna click on that, it's gonna get canceled. The second it's canceled, I'm notified, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna buy a ticket, because a ticket for the show has now become available. Right? Because it got canceled. And then they can sell it for like triple the price. So yeah, that's how you profit from that. <laughs> so the, the problem with that, well, the problem with that is basically that you allowed a destructive action to be performed through a get method. I'm gonna get into the methods in a, in a moment. Uh, so other examples, you can have fake forms that lead to destructive actions. So even if you expect post, if you don't do proper checks, you can still get a user to perform uh, an action that they did not intend to perform. And they'll probably pick a website where everybody has an account. Like a lot of people have an account on Eventbrite, a lot of people have an account on Facebook. So those are good targets to provide links, but you know, like this guy says something else that you might want to click, like here's a funny video, click and something that you did not intend happen. Um, Clickjacking, clickjacking is when, um, it's less common nowadays, but still happens when people create like a transparent layover on top of something. So you think you're gonna click a button, but what actually happens is you click on that transparent div and it's gonna catch the action, it's gonna do something else, right? And you can create those transparent layers via JavaScript that you can inject. So you can combine those attacks to create something um, where the user actually trusts the website they are on, they want to perform an action and you make them do something else. You make them maybe click a button that posts a form with data that you did not want it to post. So I'm gonna show you a demo of how that works. And as I said, there are many ways to perform a CSRF attack. It's a rather broad category where, oh, there it is. Don't know why I put it at the end. So here with the cross-site request forgery, uh, it's a multi-step thing, so you know the diagram I showed you about refunding a ticket. Let's say I create a new purchase for, for the purpose of this, um, of this um, demonstration. So I'll create a purchase. Here's my ID, purchase amount, okay? And see, I have a refund here. Refund slash six. So I'm going to refund this transaction. If I send this link to someone, and this guy said something else, something that somebody wants to click, it's going to perform the action because I am the owner of um, I purchase number six and I am legitimately logged into the website. Uh, therefore, that action will go through. And I click refund and it gets refunded. So I, I don't need to show you how I send the link because it's just a link, right? It's very basic. So, and the reason why it works is because here it is, it's like, it doesn't check for the method. So if it's a, a get method, so when you click a link, that's usually, uh, that is actually always a get method. And if you, it leads to any sort of destructive function, uh, destructive action, then you have a problem. Okay, then, then people can, can exploit that, but you can fix it. And the way to fix it is, and this is maybe a little bit more complicated in, in Symfony, but what you do here is you have a refund button. Of course, this is gonna work on this side, but I cannot reproduce this from another page, right? Because what happens here is the, the refund it's a CSRF, uh, there's a CSRF token that gets generated. Actually, I'm gonna show you um, the inspect. So basically here I just set up a basic form and I get the name of the button that was clicked and the ID is contained in the button and I just refund it like that. But, uh, uh, there we go. View page source. So what, um, 
what the symphony form has done for me automatically, by the way, is that, so you see you have four submit one, submit seven. Uh, can you see in the back? Is it large enough? Okay. So I have, I have this form with multiple submit buttons and what automatically got created for me by Symphony, which is really nice, is this token. And what the token does, it's, it's random, uh, but it ensures continuity. What happens is that if I display the form here and somebody else is gonna try and submit uh, without this token, the, the, the form is going to know because what it does is as soon as it generates this value, it puts it into the session. So now you have a token in the form and a token in the session. If you submit through the same form, you're going to submit that token and it's going to compare it to what it has in the session and it's going to check out. But if somebody puts a form somewhere else, they don't know what that token is because it's in the session. They don't have access to it. So if they put potato in there, and they, and they make you submit. Yes, you will submit the form, but you have potato, whereas in the session here, we have something else. And that is how you protect against CSRF attack. Did that explanation make sense to you? Okay. So that is actually pretty basic, out of the box. Uh, I mean, the, the, the really complicated part is the whole button name and extracting the ID, but really you just create a form Okay, for as many purchases as you have. Uh, in the case you have one purchase per page, it's even simpler. So you just have like a form. And when you, um, when you output the form, it's going to automatic, uh, Symfony and other frameworks will automatically create a token, a CSRF token for you. And they're going to handle the validation automatically. If you have to write it out of the box, you can look up some examples on the internet on how to do that. Let's say you're using some really old legacy, um, uh, you're maintaining some really old legacy code. You may not have all those tools at your disposal, so you might have to write your own. But it's, it's rather straightforward, so you just need, to, uh, just need to look up those examples. So yeah, the, the idea is first not, um, uh, no, so the general structure of, of this type of attack is to trick a user to perform an action of your site. Uh, your site by default doesn't care where the request comes from, it's just a request. They don't know who the user is, it's just any request for the browser, it's gonna process it and it's up to you to make sense of it. Uh, it's not really a problem with REST APIs because of just the general structure of that. Uh, they're stateless uh, already, so they, you already will build them in a way that will have those verifications. But it's very easy to forget when you have a session in your cookie. It's very easy to forget about that, so it's something that really only affects. Um, you don't have to authenticate every single request, therefore um, you, you can lose track of that and you don't implement the safety measures. So the solutions are pretty straightforward. There's three major solutions, although there are other. Uh, so the countermeasures for CSRF attacks is don't let get actions have any sort of side effects. So the get should only read information and display to. It should not delete things, it should not create things, it should not update things. Um, the only thing you should do through the get methods is display things. That way people cannot very easily hijack the session through a link. The other thing is if you are going to submit any form, if you are going to use a post method, uh, then you still have to use a CSRF token. And you might actually spot you know, some websites where if you open a second tab and you already were on that form and you open a second tab and suddenly um, the first one stops working because the token has been refreshed on the other one. So you might have come across that um, protection having this uh, nasty side effect. Although there are tools that uh, make that a little less painless uh, or less painful. So yeah, this uh, CSRF token is available in all major frameworks. So if you create a form, it will automatically 
put it onto your page when you output the form through the framework, and it's going to automatically verify things. And the third thing you can do also is re-authenticate the people for important operations. Uh, so what this does is, let's say somebody manages to hijack, you know, and get into your, there's also like session writing where, um, there's another type of attack where they can, say you put your, instead of putting your uh, session ID in the cookie, you put it in the URL. Some people still do that. So if it's in the URL, I can wait for you to authenticate, send you my own session ID as a link. And when you click that, it's going to attach the new, uh, it's going to attach your own session to that ID. Okay, so let's say, um, let's, say you, uh, let's say I am the attacker. Okay, I, I went to the website and the website gave me a URL with like session ID 123. And I send you a link with session ID 123. And you click that link and then it asks you to authenticate, so you authenticate. So now your session is bound to the ID 123. So 123 is going to, con to be, um, uh, you, it's going to belong to you. But then if I put 123 in my URL, I will get access to whatever you had access because you just made that session ID legitimate by authenticating. It's not quite obvious. Maybe a diagram would have helped. So uh, let me let me be the user, or this is the attacker. Okay. So the attacker, what it does is, so this is the app. Okay, and this is the unfortunate user victim. Okay, so the attacker is authenticating, sending credentials. Or actually doesn't even need to send credentials. Just needs to go and probably the session will be created and he's gonna get like a session ID. SID from the URL. SID equal one, two, three. Okay? So question mark SID equal one, two, three. That's what he gets for any request. He can see that in the URL. So the attacker now sends a link to the user um, with whatever, you know, and session ID equal one, two, three, and probably sends something that requires the user to authenticate so the user will not think twice and is going to enter their credentials, okay? And so the user arrives uh, at this URL and is going to send credentials. Okay, what does the application do with that? Well, it it doesn't create a new. Uh, so basically, it um, already has a session for one two three, identifier one two three. So it's just going to use it. It's not going to create a new uh, session on the server. So it's just going to reuse that. Okay, and when the person is authenticated, it's like okay. So it's just going to update the user ID that's logged in in t in its session on the server. Okay, so it's going to like point it to this other user. So I am user one, this is user two. Okay, so now that session on the server used to be, uh, you know, u equal one, but now with the credentials, it's going to check out, everything is good, it's gonna say u equal two. So now this session points to data for user two. All right? At that point, what happens if now the attacker accesses the website with session ID 123? What are they going to see? Any guesses? Yeah, logged in as user 2. So now they have access to user 2, all of their data. Okay, and that is, that is why you should never have your session IDs through the URL. You're making it painfully easy, <laughs> right? So that is another way of hijacking sessions. So to, pre uh, so to prevent those kind of things, there are other ways to, to, um, to get those session IDs and, and you know, mess with that and, and get, in, get another, user, uh, uh, another user authenticated as that session ID. What you want to do in that case is to re-authenticate 
um, for important operations. Um, or you want to also regenerate the session ID every time somebody logs in, okay? Or even after a certain period. So if, for example, you have this additional layer of security where you say, well, every time a user logs in, we're going to regenerate that just in case. And by doing that, you are severing this connection. One, two, three will never be attached to user two, so nobody else can, can get that. And that is particularly dangerous uh, on websites where people share content. Let's say somebody finds some interesting page on that, on that website, but they can also create things or, or delete things. So they uh, take the link, you know, with a whole bunch of uh, parameters in the, in the URL, and they post it on Twitter, they share it, like, hey, uh, I found this interesting bit of content, you should read it. But then the, that information is in the URL, so people can inadvertently expose their session ID and open it up for, um, because then somebody else just needs to type in that session ID, doesn't need to go through all those shenanigans, just needs to grab the session ID and have access. It's the same as having the password. Okay, so don't put it in the, don't put that information in the, um, in the uh, query string. Uh, Reauthenticate for important information, uh, for important operations. So you might have noticed on some websites, if you want to change your password, it's going to ask you to reauthenticate it. Or if you change something important like your email address, things like that, it might ask you to uh, reauthenticate just to make sure that this is still you. Okay, so nobody can cheat their way into it. Well, we might even get through number nine. Uh, this means we'll have more time for the exercises and more time for the last part, which can be quite fun, depending on the audience. <laughs> so it's going to be an interactive session at the end where we will try to figure out, try to classify different risks and threats and like try to figure out how much they're worth. So broken authentication and session management, it's a bit similar to the other one. Um, we can do a data interception demo. I will not use this data for any evil purpose, but uh, what we're going to try to do now is, actually it's running on different machines, so maybe I'll do like this. So the, it's basically Wireshark is, uh, what it does, it sniffs packets on the network. So I can start capturing packets. Okay, so we're gonna see packets go through. Okay, so every time something happens, all the, all the stuff is going through. So let's go to example.com. And for example, user equal me at ifelina.com and pass equal one, two, three. Okay, let's say I do this. Okay, good. Let's stop capturing. All right, so what happened here? Uh, let's hope I can find that packet too. Uh, let me remember how, how to filter things here. So, 93, I said stop, that's a high ping, uh, there we go, 93, oh, there is something interesting, I mean it's not fun, but still, we have something, hypertext transfer protocol, uh, let me, check which category I need. Oh, this is the filter I want. Ah, see, there, I found it through a filter. Basically, I'm looking at the query parameters that contain user, and I can see it in clear text. So if you, I don't know if you can really see that well, because I, on some other uh, older version of the operating system, there was like a shortcut and it's not working. 
Yeah, so here we found it. We found my request where we have pretty much everything in plain text. That is because we did not request example.com through HTTPS. And if you do send any sort of data, whether it's in the get, whether it's in the headers, it doesn't matter. It's readable if you send that directly um, without HTTPS. So anybody who is on the same network can see all the packets that go through the network. I just recorded like over 300 packets in a couple of seconds, right? Actually, not that many. But all the, all the traffic that's going through the network right now is, is visible. We can scan it. We can apply some, uh, some rules. And we can, we can leach all the data. So if we know that somebody is um, accessing some websites that have login forms without SSL, which I actually found, somebody tweeted at me and said, hey, take a look at this, um, at this page. Like, uh, cause I entered some credentials there, I forgot, so I entered the same password I used on my iCloud, and like 24 hours later, my iCloud got, uh, somebody got a login from the same region where the site is operated. So it's like, it's kind of weird. It's like somebody stole my credentials. I said, is that possible? So I took a look, and yeah, I mean, it's very possible because the, the form is not protected. I mean, some people think that you can only sniff packets if you are within the same uh, network, but it, it's actually possible. It's a bit more complicated, but it's possible to like be in, get in the middle remotely, uh, and that allows you to sniff packets everywhere around the world. So if somebody has an unprotected login form, that that's the death of it. And it was like a huge hardware manufacturer. I was like really surprised, and I tweeted at them many times, and they never replied. I offered them the security workshop. <laughs> their loss. So yeah, this, this is the example I wanted to show you, to s show you how easy it is to intercept that. Uh, you get all the data, you get um, even information about the computer accessing, um, uh, making the request. So data interception is extremely simple. And session fixations, oh, actually I did. Have a, I remember they had a diagram for that. Yeah, so session ID, SID one, two, three. So here's the diagram I just drew on paper. <laughs> there it was. Um, so basically here we um, hijack the session ID and can get access to any user's account this way. We can either um, hope for somebody to post a link with their session ID or we can target someone specifically and just email them a link and tell them to click that for, for whatever reason. And people don't think twice when they click links usually. Um, so many ways to do that through uh, URL arguments, of course, through some hidden form field. You can put some, um, some hidden fields uh, to make the form have, uh, to, to not show it up as a field, but still submit the necessary data to cause some harm on the other end. Um, and you can also do that through cookies by, you know, forging your own cookies and sending that in the headers. So you can actually modify cookies through XSS. So there's a lot of those where if you, you, can, you can combine multiple vulnerabilities to, like, get even more access. So through XSS, you can access the cookies. You can also inject JS that overrides a session ID. And so you can do a lot more interesting things with that. So regenerate session uh, login on ID, uh, time out those session IDs. Like even if you store them in cookies, even if they're not uh, directly visible in the URL, you still should uh, protect yourself against that by regenerating this from time to time. So make it expire. Uh, again, SSL all the things for the reason I showed you with uh, uh, Wireshark. Uh, frameworks usually have pretty good built-in session management, so read up on what is available in the framework that you're using, in the version you're using, and if something is missing, you're going to have to create it yourself. So some of them could automatically regenerate your session ID, some of them won't, so you might have to write that little thing uh, in addition. Uh, don't store any uh, data in cookies. So use cookies just for authentication, but don't put any private data there 
because it is essentially um, you are at the mercy of whatever happens in the browser. If somebody can intercept that cookie um, through XSS or any other means, then basically that data becomes public knowledge. And also take a look at your uh, how you manage your password, how you change or recover your passwords, um, because people can also exploit that. So, let me see if we have time, because we have eight minutes left, uh, but the next session, uh, the next section has, the next section should be doable. If not, that's not a big deal, we'll uh, pick up where we left off. So, regarding security misconfiguration, and this is, this looks like pretty basic, stuff. However, so many people are making these mistakes, I have to point it out. Uh, default configurations. Um, default configurations sometimes will not have a password or, you know, the usual, you buy a new router, the username is admin, the password is admin, and you just keep it because why the hell not? And somebody manages to connect there and then you can go and change your settings, things like that. But imagine this with databases and stuff. You also have a lot of applications that when you install them on your server, they come bundled with some default accounts and some default credentials, and those can be admin accounts. So they, people can do a lot of harm through those. Uh, so what you want is to carefully analyze what comes by default and, and tune those uh, configurations. You can have outdated software. Uh, your Op uh, operating system can become outdated. Uh, your server, you know, Nginx, Apache, can become outdated and um, there are known vulnerabilities that have been fixed already, but you, if you don't update your tools, then um, you are still vulnerable. And the stack traces can provide me a lot of information, of course, about what versions of what you are using. Just by method names, I can, by method signatures, you can tell which version of the library that is. So all of your composer uh, packages, you have to be careful with that and update them rather often. Uh, I know it's sometimes it breaks things, but if you don't keep up, if you don't update that, um, you can you can be in serious trouble. Uh, any sort of publicly accessible code. So uh, publicly accessible code is a bit what I showed you earlier. When you configure your server and you uh, you have like index.php at the same level as your configuration, so you point your server to that folder, and from that folder everything becomes accessible. There are other ways, of course, to expose your code. I know um, some of the more widely used applications um, are actually not by default protected from those, or if you use like an older version of WordPress, for example, you will have that problem. And uh, outdated plugins, um, who here had their WordPress site hacked at some point? Nobody. Does nobody run WordPress? No. Okay, good. That's good. Well, I had a, uh, I had a blog uh, through WordPress for many, many years, since 2008 or 9, I think, maybe earlier. And. Uh, at some point, somebody, well, actually, people hacked it several times through various plugins, but the one I remember the most, which was kind of fun to think about, was uh, the syntax highlighter. Because it actually, <laughs> yeah, something so, like, that seemed so harmless at the time actually had an interesting vulnerability. Because you can put the code to highlight, but you can also include code from your server to show and, and highlight. And somebody highlighted my configuration file with the database credentials. Like, what? What the hell? Somebody stole that from me? So I go and change it. And I go to the comment again, and it's the same. Uh, it's the new password. I'm like, OK, something different is happening here. So then I went and I read on that. And I found that I had a plugin that was at a version that had this vulnerability where people could include arbitrary files. And basically, I just disabled that feature. I updated the plugin, but I also disabled the feature to do that because I didn't really need people to include files to highlight in comments, right? Because they're commenting. They don't have access to my server anyway, so that was pointless. 
Uh, yeah, and you can you can display arbitrary files. I'm actually going to show you an interesting example of how to achieve that yourself through various uh, vulnerabilities in extensions. Um, here are some interesting examples from the wild. Uh, MongoDB, by default, does not require credentials. So that is a moment for uh, a Picard facepalm. Um, more than 27,000 MongoDB databases were seized by ransomware. Yeah, I hear size. I mean, that's, that's a lot of installations. That's a lot of databases. Um, I actually find this a lot in Internet of Things hype when it first started. People were going really fast and completely unaware of security. And actually a company came to me, they wanted, um, they wanted to do a security audit for their API. It was for unlocking BMW cars with the cell phone. So they came to me for a security audit and they said it was too expensive. <laughs> then I read the news. <laughs> Like uh, about half a year later, I read the news. I'm like, I guess it's more expensive now, <laughs> right? So yeah, they're, they're going too fast and um, really not checking what they're doing. Uh, another example, uh, also facepalm worthy in my opinion. So the Petya, which uh, apparently came out of Ukraine, I think, that's where it was the hotspot. And it infected corporations, power supplies, uh, banks worldwide. Um, and that is because the victims of that did not patch their software. Basically, there was this 30-year SMB v1 file sharing protocol, like with some old windows, and they just didn't update it. They just kept it running, like, yeah, my, my servers are running fine, and they have this protocol that they don't even use, probably. Um, but it was there and it was known for a very long time that it had a vulnerability and people didn't patch it. Uh, I mean, even I remember a few years after um, Heartbleed, I was still contacted by people to update their uh, OpenSSL, which couldn't even be updated because their operating system was so outdated it wouldn't even support that. And that was years after Heartbleed. So it takes a while for people to catch up. Uh, so yeah, this I already explained. Uh, the solutions to that is update so software and libraries on time, very important. Turn off debug mode so you don't expose too much um, about what you have. Don't, don't show your, uh, your hand, basically. Um, change default passwords, tune security settings. Uh, you can have automatic uh, security checks, uh, uh, automatic configuration checks, and also um, uh, so you can check, you know, whether your packages are all up to date. Um, you can secure your architecture, so think about the different layers, and just you know continue with this uh, hardening process. So think about the surface of attack. Uh, do you have applications running that you don't need? Do you have any? Um, do you have any ports that are open? You know, do you have any dead code, things like that? Maybe you're no longer even using a certain extension, uh, but for some reason it's still uh, uh, somewhere out there. And because you're not using it, you're probably not updating it on time. It's actually a very nice command. Uh, I'm going to post the slides so you'll have access to them. But if you execute this command, you can check your composer.log file for any possible vulnerabilities. So it's going to check the different versions of all your packages, and it's going to compare them to the Sensio Labs um, database that uh, actually the, the check pulls the data from um, the, I think, a Friends of PHP repository, and basically it tracks all the different vulnerabilities in the packages. So when you do that, it's going to show you which ones are potentially vulnerable. 